Hello and welcome. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for May 8th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and myself, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at CircuitPythonistas role. There's a notes doc to accompany the meeting in the recording. The final notes doc includes timestamps to go along with the video. So you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. And after each meeting, we post the link to the next meeting's notes doc in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pins messages to find the latest notes doc so that you can add your notes for the following meeting beforehand. If you wish to participate but can't attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates and the host will read them off for you. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. This is a brief look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a qual quantitative <laughs> overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. Third, we have hug reports, which is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and take time to, to recognize folks in our community. Uh, fourth is status updates. This is a chance uh, for us to talk about what we've been working on and what we plan on working on in the coming week. And lastly, we have in the weeds. This is an opportunity for any more longer form discussions or debates that we need to have and, and make some decisions. Uh, generally, uh, these are identified ahead of time, but um, if you have, if you think something, think of something during the meeting, feel free to drop it in the notes doc, um, even if we're in the, in the weeds talking about something else. Uh, Notes doc is the place to get a topic on there. And that's how the meeting will go. And with that, I will switch docs and take a timestamp and get started with community news. So uh, this is a brief preview of the My Python for Microcontrollers newsletter that comes out tomorrow. So it covers all things Python and, and Makery and that sort of stuff. So. Uh, First up, we have quite a list, um, but I wanted to talk about a number of these things. So the first thing on the list uh, is a there is a new Raspberry Pi OS update, and it includes the Linux 6.1 kernel. Um, this is the first update to the official operating system for Raspberry Pi devices in three months, and is notable for being the first version powered by Linux 3.1, which is an LTS kernel, uh, the previous kernel was 5.15. The newer kernel offers improved hardware support, new drivers, performance boosts, and better security. Gamers will appreciate the addition of new, of new gamepad drivers. Uh, the update also features updated software, including Chromium 113, Mathematic 13.2.1, MATLAB, Raspberry Pi Imager, and big updates to li LibX Camera, Lab Camera Apps, including improved thumbnail rendering and Pi Camera 2, which includes EXIF date and time tags. And there's a couple uh, covered links in there. Thank you, Foamy Guy, for dropping those in. Uh, next on the news list, we've got the European KiCad conference will be held September 9th and 10th uh, this year. Uh, KiCon, uh, the KiCad conference, is the largest gathering of hardware users and developers using KiCad. Following the success of the first KeyCon in 2019 in Chicago, this is the second annual KeyCon and the first one in Europe. <laughs> if you're interested in KeyCAD as a user, developer, or contributor, this is the place to be. It will be held at Polexco Conference Center in A Coruña, Spain. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too bad. Uh, from seven, September 9th uh, through the 10th. And there's a link there to keycon.keycad.org. Next up, we have CircuitPython and version control. 
The Moving Electrons blog discusses CircuitPython and version control in projects. Just like coding on a computer, CircuitPython would benefit from some form of version control. A simple Linux bash script is created to manage the Git workflow and copying files. Next up, uh, EduBlocks is acquired by Anaconda. Uh, Anaconda is the provider of the world's most popular data science platform. Today announced the acquisition of EduBlocks, a free web-based drag-and-drop Python coding platform built to help K-12 students learn fundamental skills. With EduBox, Anaconda expand, expands its reach and offerings for K-12 schools, as well as for beginner-level professionals. Uh, and uh, those of you who may know that Josh has been a huge uh, advocate of CircuitPython and Python, and EduBox has CircuitPython support as well. Okay, next up. Uh, what's the best language for microcontrollers? MicroPython, CircuitPython, Arduino, or C? Um, this uh, make use of takes a look at four popular methods and finds that it, it can truly depend on what type of user is looking for their program, looking to program for their project. There's a link there. Rust is not one of the options. Um, speaking of compiled languages, uh, nice segue there, if I do say so myself. Uh, Mojo was just announced. It is a new programming language for AI developers. Mojo combines the usability of Python with the performance of C, unlocking programmability of AI hardware and extensibility of AI models. And uh, you can find out more by going to modular.com slash Mojo. Eugene Yan ran a simple benchmark, uh, Mandelbrot sets between Mojo and Python. The speedup is impressive, and it benefits from Python's libraries. Um, and there's a couple more things there. Oh, they have some numbers. So in Python, it took 1,100 milliseconds. In Mojo, it took 27 milliseconds. Vectorized Python was 240 milliseconds, and vectorized Mojo was 2 milliseconds. Um, I did take a brief look at this as my commentary now. Um, it's a superset of Python, so there's additional uh, like struct and different function types. It's kind of like the native decorator in MicroPython, um, but it basically takes Python in and and compiles it using um, like LLVM tooling and stuff. I think so. Uh, it's created by Modular. One of the founders of Modular is. Um, Viking his name, the guy who did Swift and um, LLVM. Uh, so that makes sense why Mojo is based on LLVM. Oh, is it my, oh yeah. Can you hear my, my mic is up against my t-shirt. My Hopefully that's, I'll switch it so it's not there. Okay, hopefully that's better. Thank you for the heads up, Katni. All right, let's move to the next comment. I was like, why don't I hear the static? That's because I can hear my voice. Um, next up, a universal CircuitPython computer. Uh, Bob Ricious has expanded the capabilities of his microcomputer-based full keyboard projects to include the Pico Computer 28 universal CircuitPython computer. It accommodates a Raspberry Pi Pi Pico, Pico W, or an ESP32 S3 as the processor, and supports either a 2.8, 2.0, or 1.3 inch display. It also accommodates a LoRa module, Grove modules, and a speaker. There's an optional battery add-on as well. A pretty neat interface. I do so, so say so myself. Uh, okay, next up. Uh, well, that was the last item of, of news. Uh, so. As a recap, uh, newsletter details. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, to contribute your own news, edit next week's draft at the GitHub repo, which is github.com slash adafruit slash CircuitPython dash weekly dash newsletter and submit a poll request uh, either there, or you may also just tag a tweet or toot for Mastodon with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter, 
or email cpnews at adafruit.com. That's it for community news. We have lots of stuff. Uh, thanks to Ann B who puts that together every week. Um, next up, Stata CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of, <laughs> of the broad CircuitPython project. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail kind of in the sub-projects. Uh, but first, I will give you an overall, some overall statistics. So overall, we had 35 pull requests merged from 24 different authors, which is awesome. I think this is a lar largely seeing the impact of uh, the sprint work at PyCon. So thanks again to everybody who ran those. Um, some new names here that I don't recognize. Ross K1, Z Bauman 3, Zemi Blue, Lanza, S Domozali 13? <laughs> Question mark? Uh, Brass 75, Uberi, uh, Jan Volk, uh, Kelman, Zachariah Pfeiffer, uh, Jay Rickerson, and Garrico are all new names there. And then we had 12 reviewers for those uh, 35 pull requests. Uh, so thank you to all of our reviewers who helped out uh, reviewing all those sprint, thing, sprint PRs. Issues-wise, overall, we had 24 closed issues by 15 people and 21 opened by 18 people. Uh, so it's great to see us in the teens in terms of uh, people involved and also net down three. Okay, with that, I will move on to reading the core. Um, so the numbers for the core are, we had 10 pull, pull requests merged. Um, I won't read off the new authors because I just did that. We had five reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. We have 20 open pull requests, which gives us a nice little cushion on the, in terms of the everything should fit on the first page. Uh, we have a, a number of drafts that are actually quite old, so um, take a look at those if you're... Yeah, Katni, Katni's on the core review list, so thank you, Katni. Um, a number of drafts, if you're involved in any of those, please take a look and see uh, what is remaining to be done. Um, love to still close those off. The oldest one is 446 days old, so it is older than a year. So it'd be great to get that done as well. Uh, Core-wise, issues-wise, we had 10 closed issues by six people and eight open by six people. So we're net down two, which is great, for a total of 634 open issues. We have eight active milestones. Um, again, uh, 8.0x milestones are used to prioritize uh, work for Adafruit funded folks. Um, 8.0x has zero open issues still, which I think is safe to say that we're not going to release any 8.0.x uh, anymore. Uh, thanks to Dan who, to getting us this far. Um, 8.1 has nine open issues, which I think I made 10 earlier this morning. Uh, but is going to be our next focus in terms of uh, stable release. And that would be great to do because that'll unlock uh, our 9.0 development, I think. Um, so we'll want to take a look at those and we'll coordinate with Dan when he's back from vacation. Um, that's a bit about our uh, milestones now. And with that, uh, we do have two issues not assigned to milestone that we'll want to triage as well. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Katni for the library update. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So this section applies to a lot of things. Uh, it applies to uh, all the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore. And it also applies to all of our community libraries, which can be found in the community bundle. And these are libraries submitted by community members and also maintained by them as well. Uh, in terms of pull requests across all these repositories, we had 22 pull requests merged from 16 authors. Uh, a number of the new folks are on this list as well, so thanks so much to all of them. And nine reviewers, which is pretty high, and that's also excellent to see because the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. Um, in terms of merged pull requests, uh, 80 is the oldest 80 days is the oldest one we merged so i'm really glad to see that we're still working through um some of those older prs um and the rest were a week or less leaving us with 63 open pull requests in terms of issues we had 14 closed issues by nine people and 11 open by 11 people 
uh, leaving us with 598 open issues. 56 of those are good first issue, uh, which we were... La before PyCon, I think we were pushing 79, so that's really great to see. Um, if you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including um, a list of all the open pull requests and a list of all the open issues. If you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, uh, take a look at the code, let us know if you see anything, and um, that way, uh, once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. Um, if you're interested in contributing uh, Python code or um, documentation, etc., uh, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, good first issue is a uh, great place to start. Um, those are issues identified that uh, we, we identify that folks who are new to uh, contributing to open source would be able to do. Uh, as well, don't let the process intimidate you. We have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we also are always available on Discord to help. Uh, in terms of weekly PyPI download stats, uh, the total uh, over 311 libraries that we're tracking on PyPI, the total downloads were 91,945. And if you check out the notes, there is a list of um, the top 10 PyPI downloads. The top ones are almost always the same, but uh, the top three rather, and then the rest uh, are always changing up. So if you're interested in uh, who's downloading what, um, check that out and you'll get a feel for what people were working on this week. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had three new libraries uh, this week. Um, Adafruit Circuit Python Wave, uh, we had uh, Biplane from Uberi and CircuitPython LPS28 from Jose David. Uh, there are some updated libraries as well that I will not read off, but they are in the notes if you're interested. And that's what I've got for the libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Next, we'll go to Melissa for an update on Blinka. Uh, hello. Uh, let's see here. Um... Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for um, Raspberry Pi, uh, or MicroPy 5 Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. And I am not seeing the Blinka in the notes here. So, oh, I found it. I, it there was just some new sections added in the last one, so it got lost. Mm -hmm. um, this week we had three pull requests merged by three authors and two reviewers. There are currently six open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There were zero post issues by zero people and two open by two people, uh, leaving a net of 98 open issues. There were 13,862 uh, PyPI downloads in the last week and 11,314 PyWheels downloads in the last month. And we are currently at 106 ports. And that's it. Thanks, Melissa. All right. And um, that's it for the State of Circuit Python libraries in Blinka. Next up, we have Hug Reports. This is the first of two round robins uh, where I will start. And then we'll go down the list of folks listed in the note stock. Um, tends to be alphabetical, but doesn't always have to be. We'll just go by the note stock ordering. Um, anybody who's marked lurking or text only, I will read off. Otherwise, I will uh, call on you when it's your turn. Uh, Hug Reports is a chance to say thank you to folks in the community for the cool work that they've been doing, the awesome work or helpful work. Um, it's both nice to recognize folks and also reinforce uh, as a community what we value. So I will start. Uh, first, a hug to Furbrain for a PR adding memory map support to NRF. I just merged that this morning. Uh, hug report to Jeff uh, Jepler for awesome synth IO improvements. I'm excited to hear people get their 8-bit uh, bleeps on, I guess. Uh, and then right, retroactively, uh, Ian from Dangerous Prototypes, uh, who created the Bus Pirate, um, both for Ian and everybody who's worked on Bus Pirate, really thank you, huge thank you to being li uh, liberally licensing everything. Um, it's all like public domain and it's great to be able to reference code and not worry if I'm like copying it over too much. So uh, that's a neat project and I'm, I'm happy that they did that in the past. 
All right, uh, next up I'll read from Anic Data, who says, a uh, hug report to Naradoc, to Shipu, and Foamy Guy for helping me get builds and debug builds going again after a year hiatus. Uh, next up from DJ Devon 3 we have hug to Foamy Guy for the streams this week and everyone in the help, help with Hardware Discord channel for ideas on how to pivot from a PC de PCB design fail into a PCB design win. And with that, let's go to Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, hug reports for me this week. Uh, thank you to... Uh, Tectric for input and conversation around some uh, typing details to uh, another uh, hug report uh, again for Michael Pokisa who has uh, submitted even more improvements for HTTP server library over the past weekend. Um, hug report for Ask Patrick W for sharing the WLED project on Discord, which I had not heard of uh, and looks to be like a pretty cool thing. Um, to uh, Jose David, thank you for some feedback on a button on a uh, PR for uh, the display button library, and then a uh, group hug for everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Next, let's hear from Jepler. Where is that pesky mute button? <laughs> uh, so, Hi. I want to start off with a group hug. Uh, hugs to Scott and Liz for helpful advice about audio synthesis. And finally, to JP and Toddbot for testing on the SynthIL pull request. That's what I got. Thanks, Jeff Blair. Next up, I have notes from Jose David, who says, hug report to Foamy Guy for all of the PR reviews. Next up is Katni. All right. So, uh, hug report to Jeff for a lovely chat last week. Um, also, another hug report to Jeff for offering to help me with an issue in my code that is potentially related to the core. Um, thanks to Naradoc for some help over the weekend with my code. Um, I was trying to do a couple things that were baffling me, and uh, I received some excellent answers there. Uh, to Alec for some great chats as well. To Spavlot on Discord for sending me some feedback related to support regarding the Adafruit IO web UI causing some issues for users. Uh, I will be passing that on this week, um, but I really appreciate it because obviously um, we're not always providing the support on Discord. It's the helpers that are doing a lot of that. And so uh, feedback regarding support issues can, can really help us. Um, and then to uh, Foamy Guy for keeping up with all the PyCon PRs and a group hug. Thanks, Katni. All right, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, I wanted to give a hug to everyone who submitted Blinky boards lately. Uh, well, I've been adding new boards and realizing how many new ones there were added recently, and a group hug to everyone else. Thanks, Melissa. Next, I have notes from Mark, aka Gamboy21. Uh, it says, hug to Paul Cutler, Mad Bodger, C. Grover for recommendations on MIDI controllers. And next up is Paul Cutler. Thanks, Scott. I have a hug report for Spavlot for all their help in Discord, especially showing incredible patience um, helping one mm -hmm. user over multiple days. And a group hug for everyone else. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. All right, next up, I have two more uh, text only, so I'll read those off. First, from Toddbot, a hug report to Jepler for SynthIO improvements. And next up, we have notes from Tectric, who says, uh, hug report to Higher Effect, Gallagher, Guy DuPont, and others from the Boston Hardware Meetup this weekend. It was awesome getting to meet everyone. Very excited for the next one. Uh, hug report to Katni for great conversations over the last week and a group hug. And with that is hug reports. Next up is status updates. This has a similar format, but this time we want to hear about what you've been working on in the past week and what you plan on working on in the coming week. Um, I'll start, and then we'll go down the list, and I'll read off text only, just like I did before. Um, so first up, I spent most of the week working on Circuit Pirate, uh, which is a Circuit Python-based re-implementation of the Bus Pirate serial interface. I also added a a prompt toolkit circuit python port it's basically for making repls which is really handy it manages up arrows and entry editing 
I'm going to primarily work on that this week, uh, but I do have a couple odds and ends that I'm thinking about. Uh, one is to, I fixed some of the displays that had the wrong byte ordering, um, but the SSD 1681 didn't get uh, fixed because I didn't uh, have the screens at the time, so I have them now. I should take an hour or two and get back to that. Um, speaking of e-ink, I also got the Pimeroni Inky Frame 5 inch, which is a very awesome all-in-one board that has a Pico W soldered, soldered down. Um, it's staring at me and I wanted to do a weather uh, display on that. So that's um, something maybe I'll take a little time and do as well. Um, and then in things I've ordered news, I ordered a Pico Ice which is an RP2040 plus an ICE40. So I've, I've always wanted to do CircuitPython and FPGAs, and having uh, an FPGA alongside CircuitPython is, is pretty interesting. So I will see when I find the time to actually poke around with that. Uh, but it should be on its way at some point soon. So I'm excited for that. Uh, okay, let me read off DJ Devin 3's update, who says, A workshop lamp PCBs arrived. Unfortunately, I mixed up diameter with radius during a design change and never noticed. Now I have a 19-inch ring instead of a 9.5-inch ring. Getting supplies this week to turn it into an illuminated Lazy Susan. I 3D printed an FP FPV camera mount for an RC car. It's been a lot of fun to play with in the yard, learning a, a lot about RC lately in an attempt to shrink the sewer bot uh, even further. I got a very slimmed down version of my off, offline weather station running on the Feather RP2040 DVI. Unfortunately, when attempting to use it with the airlift Featherwing for pulling online data, I ran into memory allocation issues. Same thing attempting to run GIF.io. There's not much RAM left after a DVI gets through with it. It's a good start. Thank you to the developers working on this. It's cool to see CircuitPython on an HDMI monitor. And uh, maybe I'll tease that we, we have talked about a DVI Featherwing. So it would be the reverse where you would treat the Featherwing as a regular display. So you, so you would have a second RP2040 just to do DVI. And that would mean that you don't have to share memory with it. Anyway. I'm excited for that as well. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to Foamy Guy. All right. Um, over the past week or so, I've been uh, still doing quite a few PR reviews from the PyCon PRs. Um, I think we are pretty well caught up. All the ones uh, that are out there have been responded to and are awaiting changes, or uh, at this point are merged. There's loads and loads that have been merged. Um, the remaining ones, I think, have been responded to. So uh, if anybody listening to this does have a PR that's open that hasn't uh, been responded to, definitely let me or somebody know. Um, I uh, was also working on a, a more advanced um, HTTP server example last week. Um, this uses the 14x4 segment uh, Featherwing as well as NeoPixel Featherwing and allows the user to set what text will scroll across the segments, as well as set the colors of the NeoPixels on the NeoPixel Featherwing, uh, or you can set an animation if you want instead of individual colors. Um, this was just kind of a, a project I didn't really have a specific use for, but was interested in making. Um, and now that I have kind of the, the concept of it working, I actually am inspired to pull out the NeoPixel portion of it and try to make a more general standard-ish uh, REST API for interacting with NeoPixels and dot stars. So I'll work on that next. Um, something else that I did that kind of was tagged on to the side of that project was make it uh, basically modify the library for the 14 by four segments to be able to support non-blocking marquee text. The existing functionality blocked, uh, but I need it of course to be non-blocking so it can do the server the NeoPixels and everything else all at the same time. Um, this week, I am going back through the uh, GitHub uh, PR pages and issues and things, as well as some of the reports that Adabot spits out uh, to tabulate stats and lists from PyCon-related contributions. Uh, and I also have uh, pegged on my notes over here to uh, submit a change in the ColorSys library to make it match the CPython API more closely. Uh, and that's what I've got going on. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Next up, let's hear from Jet Jepler. 
can't decide whether I'm going to say your username or your name. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, that's fine. I do answer to both. Um, right. So I've been working on Synth.io and the pull request. The next pull request is ready to review, uh, like on a technical basis. So it adds tremolo and vibrato. Um, it adds the ability to select a note in a arbitrary frequency in Hertz, rather than just being confined to MIDI notes. Uh, that lets you build, like in your Python code, a frequency sweep, which is pretty cool. Um, I've revamped some of the way that multiple notes, uh, when you're playing multiple notes, how they are mixed together. You need to not like do arithmetic that wraps around past the 32768 to, to negative numbers. That sounds bad. Um, it's been a, um, so before what I would do is like, if there were six voices playing, I'd just divide everything by six, but then all of your individual notes end up not being very loud. So one thing that I've tacked onto this, uh, pull request is a new algorithm for that. Um, so people, people should look at it, at it. I think it's pretty cool. Um, my tests all sound good, but your, your results may vary and I need to hear from you if it's bad. Uh, next up for Synthia, we're going to do at least one more kind of set of things. Uh, a noise waveform is something that's missing. Um, so I haven't like tried to synthesize a hi-hat or that kind of thing. Um, and so like supporting percussion would be good. And then we also talked about doing uh, filtering, like a high pass or a low pass or a band pass. And the tech for doing that is called an FIR. And there's an FIR toolkit in the ARM SimSys that Lamore suggested I look at. Um, although we might want this to run on Espressive chips, so I'm not sure how that would affect it. Anyway, next up, JP discovered, um, trying to work on a demo last week for show and tell that MIDI in doesn't work in 8.1 beta with the Metro M7. I reproduced it and filed an issue. Liz offered to test on Pico to see if it's like board or port specific. And I will at least bisect and figure out what uh, pull request introduced the problem. And if there's like a clear solution, I might solve it. Uh, based on internal discussions, there are some maybe coming up things or longer term things once we start to look at nine. And those uh, could be merging Python 1.9 um, and looking at some kind of, I called it an IO and data processing block system. Um, all right, and my version number was wrong. It's 1.20. I don't know where that number came from. So uh, this is like providing a better answer to the story of, I want to pull in a block of data from a DAC and process it and then produce some kind of output to another system, uh, like a, a speaker, I2S, ADC. Um, but we'd like it to cover a range of use cases and kind of, we, we talk about doing a block or a declarative system. And the first step is just to sketch, what would the API look like? What kind of program would you be able to write? What would it do? Um, and then in fun news, I'm uh, recapping power supplies for my zero eight, ugh, Xerox 820 machine, which uh, while I was using it last week, gave out a big old puff of magic smoke. Um, so I've got like, I think I've got all the caps that I want to replace desoldered from this board. And uh, then I'll be able to boot up the main unit again and see if it still works after the smoke came out. So that's what I'm up to. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff Blair. All right. Uh, next up, it, I've got notes from Jose David, who says, uh, I'm sorry, time codes. Finally got some time to install CircuitPython and the LilyGo watch that Neradoc added support to. Learned a lot of stuff, including web workflow. Not sure who was involved in that, but I think it's great. Worked in the Bosch BMA 423 CircuitPython support, as this is the accelerometer that the LilyGo needs to, uh, LilyGo has. I need to read some more data sheets to add the step counting feature. Added CircuitPython support for the LPS 28 and the BMP581 sensors. Next up, let's hear from Katni. Hello again. So last week, the Feather RP2040 RFM95 guide went into moderation. Um, the guide is quite uh, nearly a direct copy of the RFM69. Um, the images have already obviously been updated because the boards themselves look different, um, but all the pinouts are the same. 
Um, and uh, the only thing that differs really is the um, radio example because obviously the RFM 95 has a different uh, library than the RFM 69, um, but the code is almost identical. You just replace the libraries. So if you, if you got an RFM 95 um, and you're wondering what to do right this second before that guide comes out, uh, the RFM 69 guide will help you. Uh, and then on Friday and over the weekend, uh, I worked on um, a project that I am doing as a collaboration with Noah, and um, that is a um, canary nightlight. Um, the code uses Wi-Fi uh, to get time, and um, it was also requested that it blink red if the uh, internet connection is down. Um, not necessarily the Wi-Fi, but the connection out um and and that is where i ran into a possible issue in the core um i think my code is actually running at the moment pretty consistently but um it was definitely failing very consistently uh on friday and saturday so um this week i'm gonna work with jeff to maybe sort out this this bug um if and or where it exists uh, I need to moderate a guide from Liz uh, that was finished up last week. Um, there is a Feather FE2040 USB host guide that uh, was um, moderated by uh, Lamore, and she found um, some some base issues in it. And uh, it is almost those those issues are um, copy paste from my previous guides, my previous Feather RP2040. The recent Feather RP2040 guides. So uh, I am going to be going back through all of my recent guides and fixing that stuff up so that we're not uh, copy pasting that into the future. And then I have a short list of various uh, guide updates that need to be done. Um, those are shorter uh, things than a whole guide, obviously, because the guide already exists and I just need to run updates. Um, but I want to get the, and I also didn't write this down, but I want to get the Canary code uh done solid and ready to go this week so uh that's what i've got thanks katney all right next up is let's hear from maker melissa hello uh last week i worked on catching up on messages and i started working on a pr for a flat project that i'm working on with aaron which is a story book that would generate unlimited stories for you but uh, i was running into some issues in that um, I added a large batch of uh, new CircuitPython boards, and if you blink the boards to CircuitPython.org. And I also did a um, big merge into the uh, code editor for CircuitPython and ended up finding an issue and uh, fixing that, so it should be working now. Uh, this week I um, am adding a bunch more Blinka boards. And I'm um, finishing up my PR for my cloud project. And then um, I'll work on some GitHub issues that I've been putting off that are related to Platform Detect, Blinka, and the Raspberry Pi installer scripts. And that's where I'm at. Thanks, Melissa. All right, next up is Paul Cutler. Thanks, Scott. Uh, there's a new episode of the CircuitPython Show podcast out today with Ben Shockley. Ben is the creator of the minifig boards, um, little Lego minifigure sized dev boards, which are just adorable. Um, and then all this talk of Synth.io has rekindled my interest in playing music, so I went out and bought a MIDI keyboard controller that arrived this weekend. I took piano lessons for nine years as a kid, so I'm curious to see how rusty I really am. That's all I got, thanks. Thanks, Paul. All right, uh, and lastly, we've got two text-only folks, so I'll read those off. Uh, first is from Toddbot, who says, Synth.io algorithmic composition fun with LFOs and AMP envelope on the Cutie Pie RP2040. There's a YouTube video there that I'm holding myself back and not watching right now. Uh, Toddbot noticed that bus.io UART on CircuitPython 8.1 Metro M7 requires timeout equals 0 0.0001 parameter. Otherwise, UART Adafruit MIDI fails to receive. Working on a creating a succinct bug report to characterize the issue. Uh, and side note for me, that sounds like exactly what I'm procrastinating on testing uh, by doing the circuit pirate stuff. So that'll be super helpful for me. Thank you, Todd Bot. 
Uh, not Circuit Python related, Todd says, but uh, Arduino version of the Pico Step sequencers, uh, Sequencer now has rock solid syncing and sourcing MIDI clock and USB MIDI to serial MIDI forwarding. All right, and last up, we've got notes from Tectric. who says, last week, uh, my parents were in town, so nothing in the world of CircuitPython. And this week, taking a look at my backlog of assigned issues and starting to tackle them. And that's it for status updates. Thank you all. Um, the fifth and final section is in the weeds. Uh, this is a chance for any for longer form discussions that we've got. Um, so if you have any topics, uh, there are a few already, so uh, you have a chance to add more if you have them. Uh, just stick your username and then uh, a beef, brief blurb of what you'd like to talk about. Uh, so first up, we'll hand it over to Foamy Guy to introduce their topic. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, I actually have uh, two that are both kind of related to the typing changes that we are in the process of doing across the libraries. The first one is... Uh, around the usage of assert lines that basically assert a thing is not none. That's the specific use case that came up. Um, basically, these uh, fields on a class get set to none inside of a constructor. And then later on in a different function or property, they get set to a real value and then used for something. Um, and I don't know the exact uh, warning or error that comes out of it, but from what I understand, MyPy, um, perhaps with strict or perhaps with the default configuration, I need to look further into that bit of it, like what exactly it says and how to get it to say it. But um, MyPy flags these cases as problematic in some way, and one of the ways that you can get rid of that error for MyPy is by adding these assert lines that say, like, assert this thing is not none. Um, I wanted to raise the question to the larger team, though, uh, because unlike the typing annotations, I think those assert lines will actually end up consuming space inside the MPY file. Now, it's obviously not that much, depending on how many of those uh, lines are in a particular file or whatever, but uh, I figured it was worth thinking about since it is um, more than zero, at least as far as I understand it. Um, or unless if MyPy actually cuts those out, which is maybe something else to test that goes along side of this. Um, if they get cut out somewhere kind of like the annotations, then it's pretty much a non-issue. Um, so that's kind of the, the first one. Um, I guess I can either open up the floor to see if anybody has ideas around that, or I can do the second one, which is also kind of typing related, but not specific to this. Let's let's talk about the first one first. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can jump in on that. I think I may have advised this person to uh, to do it this way. I'm not sure. I did advise somebody to put in an assert. So, um, yeah, it's true that that will take some byte codes, and so it will take more storage. Um, a possible alternative for this one is I'm not sure why the constructor couldn't assign it an empty list, and then it could give a non-optional type. Correct type. So that would be another alternative. OK, yeah, I like that. You know, so uh, that, line, like that. that line 322 would, would assign it an empty list instead of none. And I don't know that there's anywhere else within there that like it's tested for none. I didn't see that, but I didn't look through the whole file. But that's a possibility. OK, yeah, I do definitely like that like that solution better. I had not uh, considered changing it up in a knit. Uh, but yeah, if we do some kind of, as long as we set it to whatever the final type will be, it can be empty. Um, but that should make MyPy happy as well. Um, so I'll look into that that specific one in that library and try the change that way and make sure that it, um, everything else still works fine. But if so, then I think that's probably the way to go, uh, in which case it won't really need the asserts because MyPy should be able to figure it out. Uh, so thank you to Jeff, I yeah. report on that. I think that is the best solution. I just, I also want to reiterate, I think spending code size for better error messages through argument checking is worth it usually. And okay. asserts are one way of doing that, although they don't provide great error messages. So I would say if assert really is the 
the right thing that you want to use, then use it, and, and we'll deal with the size stuff later. Okay. Um, the other one is around uh, uh, an alias for colors. So we have inside the CircuitPython typing library, we have a uh, an alias. I forget the exact name of it, but it's um, essentially represents a color, uh, either in hex color format, so an integer, or in the tuple format, which uh, some of the libraries take, uh, in particular like NeoPixels and dot stars and things, you can set them to either color format. Um, we have a bunch of places in Display.io that also have similar constraints around colors. Like they can either be int uh, with hex color or they can be tuple with um, ints inside, zero to 255. So uh, does, is it, is it bad? Is it a faux pas to use that existing uh, type alias that is inside a file called led.py? Um, even though it represents the types we need, is it bad to use that for display.io? Uh, and if uh, so, uh, would it make sense to create a more generic color type somewhere else inside typing uh, further up the chain so that we could use that for display.io as well? Or, or would it make sense to make a, a display.io specific one or something that's like pixel color as opposed to LED color? Um, uh, or is it not worth messing with aliases and just keep the union of tuple and ints? Those are kind of the, the options that came to mind at me, uh, to me f at least for different ways we could do those colors. I think generally if you want to use something broader, it should be moved like more generic, kind of like you're suggesting. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it makes sense to have the like LED color definition overlap with display IO's version, but um, the other place to put it is like since display IO is a core API, maybe it's a, maybe that's the best place to put it as well. Like you want the type really where the interface is defined, I think so. Maybe. If we declare, can you declare a type in the in the well, I don't yeah, actually, actually know. I guess. <laughs> okay. I don't know the details of the typing stuff. But... Okay. I will check into that. I think all of the ones where we've added aliases so far end up in that CircuitPython typing library. Okay. Or, or, and before that, we were doing some, I think, maybe in Blinko or some similar types of things, but they're all in typing now. Okay. Um, I'll see if there's a way I can go in the core, like maybe this, if the stubs get pulled into there somehow. I'm not sure. Yeah, because it would be good for the stubs to have those types as well then. Like, if we want to standardize it, we'd like to st standardize the stubs to it too. I okay. Think. I will uh, plan on submitting, like, a PR that makes a more generic uh, one of those and look into if it can be added in the core where it shows up in the docs. Okay. Yeah. And we just have to make sure that that's actually the types. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not sure where display AO takes tuples, for example, but maybe we do. Um, display, uh, well, yeah, not display IO core, but display button, and I think um, ultimately display shape is the one where it comes from, or shapes, I think it's okay. plural. Yeah, so maybe maybe if it's library only, then maybe CircuitPython typing is where it goes. I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, I think that was it for mine. Uh, thank you for everyone with uh, feedback. Thank you, Foamy Guy. All right, next up, Carter has a question or a topic. Yes, question. Uh, do related to a weird behavior that's RP2040 specific, and I've linked to a pull request there that kind of kicked this off. Where apparently, I think Liz is working with um, Noe and Pedro to work on something using the Nunchuck, and it wasn't emitting with the RP2040. And she's got a pull request that fixes it, but I looked into it a little further, and I noticed it's kind of just a combination of the RP2040 is doing something specific and the third-party Noonchuck doesn't like it, whereas the official Noonchuck is okay with it and keeps on rocking and rolling. And I'm just wondering if there's any, if anyone knows, like, um, RP2040 specific internals as to why that behavior is happening. And so that we could possibly make the, um, the fix in the Noonchuck library a little more elegant. And I guess let me... Uh... Didn't Jeff rep did Jeff reply on this? Or Je did Jeff we... Jeff responded with some with some possible helpful info, and I appreciate that that it was related to switching to software, right? To bit to to Bitbang to to get this pushed out. Yeah. 
and and that's i mean that's kind of if it's that that's that's great but it didn't really you know finish off like how how i could use that as a workaround and so the and i just posted an image there it's like why is it so what yeah if we're doing software bit bang that's great but the, the big question is like why that gap there i mean it i would look at the bit bang code um but i guess what i would also say is like to narrow it down whether it's a core issue or a issue with the library like i would try it on a different device that a different port that can manage to do the zero length writes yes did hardware. that so every I, I did all this uh on an m4 and there's no gap like that and and it works, works okay. great yeah and but both uh nunchucks are super happy and work fine so this is a specific so you to think rp2040 the, you think the third the party almost millisecond gap there is the problem it seems to be, yeah, because the other thing is, you, if you just do this a second time, it's it's fine, for whatever reason. You, what do you mean, you, if you do... Yeah, the third party of Chuck is okay. It's kind of like you just do this once, it knack, and I don't think you can see in that image I post, but... It knacks it. it it's, it's, it's knacking there. If you do okay. it the second time, it, it acts, and you're okay. And from there on out, it's totally happy. Whereas the we knew chuck on the very first time it looks exactly like that yeah. it's got that gap and everything but it it acts it's like it's okay with that weirdness so but Whatever so the it. second time you do the zero length right it doesn't have the gap it does <laughs> let me, or it doesn't let me look is that in the uh pr notes i just i i guess what i'm thinking of is like if that's bitbang code is in flash it's going to slow it down the first time it's used. Which could explain oh, the gap. That's possibly in what I dumped in Discord. Like, I don't think it's right doing in. any switching. But... Oh, okay, so it's not in the second one. The gap's not. Yep. Correct. Yeah, so that would be my guess. That would be my guess why, is that it's a function of there's some flash transaction happening there to load the code. Um, yeah, which is unfortunate. Like between the, okay. the start bit and the rest, though. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, well, do you think this is something that's worth digging in further in terms of possibly being a weird core issue? Um, like other thing, but other things out there may start acting weird when that happens. I mean, I feel like we would have found it. Yeah. Because, like, this is how we're doing the scan, right? Like this is how we scan for devices. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is this is the uh I2C devices device discovery, but it's essentially the I2C scan is the exact same thing just through all the addresses. Yeah. I would open a open a core issue for sure. And say that maybe in Bitbang IO for this, we want to preload from before we run it. Like I think there are like we could run a loop that basically loads the code into the cache before we run it. Um, I don't think we want to stick it in RAM forever, which would also solve that problem. But then that's like literally like bites out of the circuit Python heat that we've got to spend for something that is probably not. Yeah. Well, maybe it's run quite kind of often, but I don't know. I'd make a core issue and and maybe we okay, can okay. figure out what's yeah, I agree. happening that's... between those two things. And we'll have a documentation of what was done. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. The story it's weird. Documented. It's weird, but yeah. Uh, like, that's almost a millisecond. That's a long time. Yeah. And what's other, what else is weird is, like, why is one okay with it and one not okay with it? But that has nothing to do with CircuitPython. Mm, yeah, it could be, like, however they implemented I2C and... 
Ex exactly. How tall it has it some is. other it has some other weird quirks too. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I'll look into the source code a little bit just in case maybe I can find something. But I will open a core issue also. Yeah. One thing you one thing I do to debug this sort of stuff is like have a third pin that um, you can set from in the Bitbank code, kind of just as a, a, a way for you to align what you're seeing in the output and where you think the code is can be helpful. Yeah, in terms of a precise timing. Yeah, like if there's a bunch of code that happens between the start bit and the first byte, like maybe that's maybe that's your suspect thing or maybe like somehow there's a run background task call there that shouldn't be I don't know. Okay. Okay. But yeah, millisecond is a long time. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's all I got. Thanks, Carter. All right. Uh, next up, we have topics from Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, so I have a question about Blinka here. Mm -hmm. So with Blinka, as boards are added, there isn't really a great way for users to know which OS the boards were tested with when they were added. Uh, so for, but for board, like the uh, Raspberry Pi, this is pretty easy. But for instance, some of the Orange Pi boards were originally added with Armbian, but uh, there's at least one other distro of Debian that runs on it now. Um, I was considering adding a markdown document that people can add to, but wondered if others had any other ideas that for that. My first instinct is to put it on the circuitpython.org pages. Ah, oh, okay, that's an idea. Because that's, I assume, where people are discovering that it supports it, but maybe that's not true. Okay, that's a, actually a good idea. I could add a um, field on there. Yeah. yeah. How about, Go ahead, how about having, uh, don't you uh, versions versions of circuit python and put in parentheses which which os um this is for blink and not circuit python yeah i'm talking about blink i'm talking oh about okay blink. i'm sorry go ahead no no when you when you uh when you're loading lo lo loading circuit python it's like the library the blink a blink of library how ah. does it you know it's two separate board detects entries one for uh. one for rbn and one for uh debian so it knows which one mm. yeah i mean that's what we're looking at doing is improving it so that uh, it can work on both but I mean, just kind of as a way, yeah, way when I'm not aware, like some new OS has been added and works on the board, for instance. Yeah, and somebody wants to use it, use uh, Blinka with it. Exactly. I've run into that problem, but I, you know, I know enough to uh, go looking to see what versions, what uh, OSs are available when that happens. But not everybody can is willing or knows how to do that yeah okay i do like the idea of adding it to circuitpython.org yeah but that yeah that doesn't save you from the people that don't look there <laughs> and it also doesn't save me from the uh people who add the board but um i guess that could be added into the pull request yeah i do like i do like charles's idea of like having board detect kind of like You know, Make way, it explicit. Then, in other words, if then then if they try to use blink, uh, try to use Blinka on an OS that is not known to work, it will say, uh, uh can't do that." Well, that's essentially what it does now, but it's like which one should they use is kind of yeah, right. Like if they want to get that, around that, that check. That, 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 that suggestion can only be made on circuit uh, circuitpython.org. Okay, and then Katney mentioned um, 
uh, having documentation that points to circuitpython.org, so that could be added to like the Blinka readme. Yeah, I want. Yeah, I forget how it's instantiated, but I wonder if you could say like uh, by default check that the distribution's right and fail if it's not, and then allow them to add a flag that says ignore distribution check or something. Well, I like to not limit it because sometimes it works on the new distribution without any intervention from us. But um, yeah. then sometimes, like somebody will try something, and even though we claim it works, we're not telling them which OS that they're. Okay, so that is kind of like CircuitPython.org is the source of like support truth, or yeah, a policy. It's more of a policy thing than a yeah. I don't think it's a bug necessarily. I think it's just that you have to be have a way to tell people, you know, if they want want to know what the solution is. Right. Okay. Well, I think CircuitPython.org is the place I would put it. Okay. It's like, did you check here? Like, are there any notes that you have to be aware of? Right. Funny? Right. Okay. So I'm thinking like having the readme point to circuitpython.org dimension to yeah. check which port, which OS and then adding it to the circuitpython.org and sure. also making it so when people have a new pull request for a board, it can be, it can mint or ask them which OS they mm -hmm. um, added it on so that it's easier to maintain. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure that that's something that they mentioned for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, next up we have the wrap up. Um, so I will take another time code and hit the right button. So this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for May eighth, twenty twenty three. Um Thank you for everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us who work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the cir at CircuitPythonistas role on the Adafruit Discord. With that, uh, we hope to see you all next week. Have a great week, and thanks for stopping by. Thanks, everyone.